When it comes to acting talent, New York stages always have an embarrassment of riches on display. Today's guests are just a few of the crown jewels. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing, and I'm delighted to welcome today's gathering of performers of extraordinary gifts, experience, and achievement. Joining us are David Allen Greer, like so Anthony LaPaglia, kind of Laura Linney, really Jan Maxwell, and, over and, and Alfred Molina. Process. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. When you are first sent a script to do a show, what, aside from the number of lines that your character might have, <laughs> are the things that come into play when you think about whether it's a role that you want to do? I'm going to start with Alfred. Um, well, it, it's, I always think it's, uh, if, it's, if it's something that you read that you really like uh, or it has a, a, an immediate impact on you, it's not a punching the air moment. It's not one of those things where you suddenly go, oh my God, yes, I found a great play. Or it, it, it's actually a sinking feeling because the more you realize that you've got to do it, <laughs> you realize that all your options are closing. Hmm. And you, you suddenly sit there kind of going, oh, I've got to do this play now. And it's, it's a very odd thing. I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't know if anyone else shares that, but it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a wonderful, wonderful sort of high moment. It's, you suddenly realize, well, I can't do that, I can't do that, and that other job that might have worked out, I can't do that, I've got to do this. And, and then you sort of focus in on it, and then of course it's the, my, my wife always says that the best part of any job is the offer. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of it sort of is the kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, like, it's just then, in, in, then it's just work. And, you know. There's that moment when you start reading something and your actor brain will just turn on. You can't help it, you start working on it before you've finished it. And you're not doing it voluntarily. It's an involuntary thing that starts to happen. You start making connections. You start seeing the architecture of the script. You start seeing how things are flowing and what can be done, the potential of it. And I think that's always a moment where at least I have to go, oh, I have to really take this seriously because something is already, there's been some connections already been made. In the case of race, it was, you know, it's written by David Mamet, so I've known and loved his work since I started acting. So it was the potential. I just wanted to like the play. I, you know, I'd heard about it, I'd read about it, but I had never read the piece. When I got the script, I was, it was the feeling of, I hope I'm not let down. It's called race. That's like a play called sex, but people just eat ice cream. I wanted it to be great, you know, so I read it and I was pleasantly surprised and then I moved on from there. But that's the most thing. I just want to like it. I mean, there's nothing worse than there's all this build up we've gotten you the script, we don't know how we did it, you have disappointment and you read it and you're disappointed. So I just want to like the piece and then everything else clicks in. How many lines? How tall am I? Where am I? <laughs> you know, but that, just the play. Mine, mine's more of a kind of an instinctual thing where <clears throat> pretty much pretty much right away I, um, I, th I would say within 20 pages or so if I'm really engaged if I'm really engaged in it it's that thing you were talking about there's an automatic connection where I start identifying with that character I start to under I understand the character more or less um, on the page. And once I start feeling that, I know I'm on to the right thing. If there's, if, there's been times where I've gone back and read it, you know, two or three times to make sure. And usually by the second read, I go, oh, yeah, this is not for me. Or, or uh, yes, it is for me. But mostly it happens on the first read through where it's just a, I can't explain it, it's just an instinctual feeling that um, I can connect with this material or I relate to this material in some, in some way. I wish I was sent scripts. <laughs> I, I, I'm not of that echelon. I, you know, I have to uh, sometimes, uh, because I, I don't have a name, I have to look at a script and say, how can I make this work, you know, for me? Um, or um, I audition, you know, uh, for things because I need to pay <laughs> for my son's camp or something like that. Have any of you had the experience of either being sent a script or auditioning for a role and thinking, you know, there's this other part that I think might be more interesting for me? Has yes. that happened? Yeah, that's happened to me. 
I mean, but a stranger thing is, I, don't, I think I'm the only person that actually read for race. Everybody else was, give, was given an offer, and initially this was supposed to be a meeting, but I didn't really feel comfortable with that. I mean, I wanted to read for the part because I don't like meetings where I don't think I'm going to get a sense that I can play anything if I'm like, we're just chatting about the weather and, you know, it's just, an, I don't like that. So, especially for this, I wanted to read and um, it was great. I mean, I like reading, especially when you have something to read. If there's nothing to read, then we can have a meeting. <laughs> right, much rather. Yeah, I agree. At I least mean, I feel yeah, like I, I walk out of the room I, and I'm, I've shown you the character. I agree. And though. it's not me. You know what I mean? Well, That's you're not just selling yourself. Yeah. You're selling like, out. I, 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 I agree like, with I'm that a, because yeah. I think also directors have, especially if they offer you something that they've not seen you do before, right. I think they have a right to see, get a sense of whether you can do it or not. I also want to audition the director. Mm -hmm. Well, there's I also, also that. I also want the opportunity to be in the room with the producers and the director and, and get a sense of, do I want to spend an enormous amount of time with these people? <laughs> I there's learned a lot that. of shorthand. You, know, you think you're, you're showing them a, a taste of, all right, this is kind of the direction or your thoughts on this character. It's not fully yeah. formed. No, no. And so it's already the dialogue has already started. Yeah. So you're showing them kind of what you think about this play, this uh, character, and you're getting their feedback. So but it's it was a mistake I made many times was taking parts because I really liked the part, but I didn't really look at the the whole package. I didn't really take the director or the, who was producing it into that much consideration. And more than once that blew up in my face, I would mm -hmm. say. I do think you have to take the whole package into yeah. consideration because. But that's only, that, that's, only, that's only something you learn as after, you go uh, along. As you go on, you as kind of get some experience. Because <laughs> yeah. as, as a younger as a younger actor, I I, I did that constantly. Me too, yeah. I, I I would get I would accept a job just because I was flattered enough that I'd been asked. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm still that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still, yeah. Oh Fred, we'd like you. Would you be interested in playing the third spear cat? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like, oh, thank you, thank you. And I'd go over, yeah, and then yeah. you, you find yourself in some sort of uh, terrible kind of... Perfect storm. Yeah, <laughs> some awful But situation. you know, the, the dread for me st it starts after, you know, you get this part, and then I've never worked with this director. This is a new play. I don't know these other people. Who's really here? They haven't really cast it. I can't work with this one actor. I hope they don't give that actor this role. Mm -hmm. You know, and just there's so many invariables, and and that's where the dread for me. You walk in the room that first day. It's like going back to school, and then it's like, okay, okay, okay. Everybody seems nice. Everybody seems fine, and a um, a wonderful working environment. So it comes off. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. One thing I don't know if any of you guys feel this way, but also when I'm reading a script, there has to be something about it that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There has mm -hmm. to be, if I'm too knowing, if mm -hmm. I think I have all the answers about this play, this production, this character, the dynamics, if I think I know it all, then that's, mm -hmm. that's well, a I've, disaster. I've, but you're, it, you're a director. But <laughs> I, I, have, I, have like, I have like the fear factor thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I read it me. and I go, oh God, uh, I don't know, I can do this. I'm not that's sure. Yeah. And that's if I have that fear, yeah. then I know I should do it. Or does this work? If I is don't this, have the fear. Or what, yeah, is this a, what is this really about? Like what, it, yeah. there has to be something also that, that I haven't, so that you know you can have a, a process while you're working on it that will, you'll grow. Yeah. I mean, it's a cliche now, but the, the, the place of, you know, for anybody who's involved in any kind of creative work, the, 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 the place of least comfort Mm. Is always, I think, invariably the most exciting. We, you know, yeah, because you don't quite, because you, yeah, as, you, as you say, Tony, you don't quite know whether you can even pull this off. Yeah, I know with almost yeah, like a, within like a great a feeling, a mill, I, I, millimeter of certainty that if I'm scared of it and I want to run away, I should do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's almost like that's the litmus test. <laughs> but yeah. doesn't that change? I mean, because like, no. I call it like a cycle of <laughs> I go, oh, I want to do that project. You read it and you go, I can do this. I know this character. Then you start and that's when all that stuff says, well, maybe I'm, I don't have it figured out. I don't know if I can do this. And then you discover through rehearsal and pre okay, yeah, I think I can. I think I've discovered a route to take. And then you think you've found it. And then further on in the run, I remember it happened in race where for a, like two weeks, I just got really depressed because I was like, I thought I had it, but I lost it. It was go, where did it go? And then we would talk amongst ourselves and then you find it and rediscover it. I mean, it's like, uh, all of the, is that 
Me or is that just bipolar? No, I think it's bipolar. Do any of you guys have the three week crisis? Absolutely. Of the course, third that's week what I'm talking terrible. about. Yeah, that, you that's week three. Three. You wake up that morning, the third week, you wake up one morning, you think, and, you, and you're on the phone about to get. I have to pull out of this. I know, a friend of mine calls it the salt mine. <laughs> That's <laughs> it, exactly what I'm talking about. The third week is the salt mine period. <laughs> it's always, it's where you're just like, you know, you're yeah. a thousand yeah. feet And you're really convinced that the, the best yeah. thing you can do for everyone concerned is to, is yeah. to pull out. Is to bow out. Can't, you know. Thank you so much for <laughs> trusting me. I mean, in my case, it often is the best thing for the entire world. As we talk about this, what's going on in your mind? You talked about getting the part, talked about um, going through the rehearsals, but in the period from the time you know you're going to play a role until you get to that first rehearsal, what is the work that you do? How much preparation do you do on your own and how much do you start forming a character or not before you get there? Well, I, I mean, I, again, to me, if it's a new play, that's different than doing a play that I've wanted to do, that I've seen other productions of, whether it's Shakespeare or Chekhov or a contemporary play. To me, that, I mean, it depends on the piece. If it's a classical piece, that would be a different preparation, wouldn't you think? I mean, you know, a classic role that we've all seen before, whether it's Romeo and Juliet or Othello. And also, if you're playing a role, if, if the character you're playing is someone who actually existed historically, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or if it's completely fictional, there might be some homework to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, it kind of depends, really. It's research. Yeah. Friends of mine call it golden time. It's mm. having a job you don't have to show up to yes. yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're just right. happy that yeah, you have. Yeah. But I think that once you go into the trenches, it's. You know, I, I think it's uh, research to me is the most interesting part about acting. I yeah, really fun. absolutely it is. love the research it is. different things, and it's and it's uh, it's different things for com you might research something more if it's a comedy or some, yeah. you know, it's it's. But it's I, because I absolutely when you're researching, you're brilliant in the part. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and no one yeah. and no one can question. Especially you. when you're brushing your teeth in the morning. I do, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I. I hesitate and always am careful about not doing too much before. Like mm. the research, uh, the context, I'll do a lot of research on context, place, if someone a, has a particular profession, anything that could inform the character. But I, I don't go into the deeper work because I want to knit whatever I'm doing to the person I'm working with. Right. So that the responses to things don't come from me, but really come from whatever I'm working you with can, so I, you, you can, if so you, I you can really, there. you know, uh, uh, I do a lot of reading about what, what you're saying about the outside, the yeah. peripheral stuff and uh, the Contri world. The contributing factor. Yes, the world. Mm. And, but I, I agree is that, you know, I have once or twice thought, you know, I'm gonna really going to get ahead of this and I'm really going to kind of like do all the detailed stuff. And then you get there and you get opposite the actor and you go, Oh, they interpreted this much differently <laughs> than I ever. Uh, so it really, because it really is about what the other person, it's the combination of what you're giving them and what they're giving you. And if you're locked into a certain mindset or an idea of yeah. what something should be, it, it, it's nothing but trouble. And then it's yeah. not a shared experience. No. You know, just as just as the audience shares with the people on stage, the people on stage are sharing with each other. and if. If it's a predetermined thing, then it's a little, um, it's hard to. It's called to procedural television. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called. And so you could kind of give the research a light touch. Like for Royal Family, I looked up the Barrymores, but we had nothing to do with the Barrymores. You can't play a Barrymore, but, you know, just something quirky might come out of it. You go, well, I might throw that in there. I might throw that in there. I don't know. But, but you're right. You don't do anything in depth until you get to rehearsal because you've got other people know, to relate to. I was watching, to. like, with our, even with our play, which is, has no social content, no political content, no, no it's fluff. Check but your brain at the door. But I, but I actually watched movies from that period because it's set in the 30s. And, and I watched you know the behavior from the 30s and actually found, I play an Italian character in the, in, in the play, and I actually found this character. It was quite genius. And, and I kept watching it over and over because somewhere in that guy was the key to Certain certain bits of behavior and the and his accent was deplorably bad, but perfect for what I wanted. <laughs> so when you get into the rehearsal room and you do meet these other people and the director goes to work, how do you find your way in that collaboration? How much 
is is it the director? How much of it is just the mixing and melding of people? Well, that's the uh, that's the that's the alchemic element. That that's the thing that you have no control over. You know, unless yeah. you're unless you're <coughs> one of those actors in in that uh, dubious position of having control over casting, which I've always think I've always thought was a kind of weird sort of thing. Um, but uh, you know that that's the ma that's the magical. Thing that's the bit when all the you know that's like all the ingredients come together and you have no idea how it's going to go and you pray or well, at least I do I mean you, you pray on a nightly basis that everyone's going to be as uh, as hard working and conscientious <laughs> as you are <laughs> <laughs> right. or not but, or not <laughs> but you know it, but it is it's and it's as much to do it's got and very often it's got very little to do with. Um, with the skill in the room, or the, or the, because uh, you know, you take it for granted that people are there because they, you know, someone knows what they're doing. Uh, but it's, it can often be just a chemical thing between people, and, 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 and often companies take a bit of time to, they take time to, to, to settle and to kind of find mm. the level, you know. And I, I mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've been very fortunate that in all the years that I've been acting, I've only had a bad experience like that once, mm. which, Kind of isn't bad. No, you know, no, are you amazing, kidding? Actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, the, the thing about the theater that you don't get anywhere else, and it's what I love about the theater, is the luxury of time. There's mm -hmm. certain things you cannot just create. It's not instant pudding. I mean, it starts that way. It You're starts with things me. being thrown, <laughs> being thrown together. But a play, I always feel that I need at least six months, hmm. and around month three is where it really starts to take on much more of a life of its own. It's just time. You can't rush your relationship to people, to the words, to the space, to your understanding of what you're doing. And then there's that wonderful period of time where you stop working on the play and the play starts working on you. And there's an enormous freedom that comes with that. But you have to earn that. that it doesn't matter how talented you are, who you're working with, Unless you have the time, you can't force something to grow. Which always is interesting to me because, you know, they, they've they taken to reviewing plays in previews yeah, now. Yeah. Which, which is, is like, you know, it's a work in progress still. And then, We've all said that, oh, it's three months yeah. later, why don't they come It's interesting yeah. because, uh, you know, yeah. I, I remember when I did view for a year, and even in month seven, I would come up, uh, you know, I'd come up, come up against the line and I'd think, that's yeah. what that means. Uh, yes. And it took me that long to, to yeah. digest the thing in its entirety. But you know what? To answer your question, I remember we, we, I did a, a production of Merry Wives of Windsor, and Daniel Sullivan was the director. I played Master Ford in the park. So we're talking. You know, I'd never worked with them before. And, I, and we're a few days into rehearsal, and I'm like, it, it feels like Master Ford, this character in Shakespeare, is doing a tragedy, and everybody else is in a comedy. I mean, you're the director, what do you think? And he said, uh, you know, David, this is the third time I've directed this play. I've never gotten it right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going, and I was like, oh my God, yes, here we go. You know, so that was sometimes it's that thing. It's a, it's a journey you. of discovery with everybody, uh, the director included. So yeah. the way we worked, as I said, there was a particular scene where I was like supposed to come in disguise, but it wasn't really disguised because it's the theater and, you know, this whole thing. I'm like, well, how in disguise is he? So I would try these dialects, and it was like, well, I'll try this dialect today, and even if it's horrible, <laughs> just let me just go through the run-through. It'll make itself known. I mean, we'll know if it stinks. And then, so we did that until we found something that was right. But, I mean, I don't know. That's how it worked in that particular thing. He did not have the answer. He did not come in the room saying, I have a concept for this production, and I know how to do it. I didn't either, so it was a journey together. I mean, I like that sometimes, you know? I interviewed Shirley Knight very recently, and she made the comment that she never gives a performance, it's always a rehearsal. Is that oh, yeah. sort of the feeling for you? Does she take the rehearsal <laughs> money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. A little different. Yeah. Not quite. Not, no. not quite. It depends no. on the play. A rehearsal, the re re a rehearsal is actually essentially a private experience. Yes. It's, pri it's a private well, thing. It's the actors and the director, or used to be. A performance yeah, is like a universal... Well, tour. there's another character there, the audience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, to take a play out of a rehearsal hall and put it on the stage and all of a sudden the audience is there and I'm, you guys know. But I know I mean, you think you means. know how this thing is means. going. And yeah, then well, I, I think she could be that relaxed. She's a liar. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, there's a constant, there is a constant evolution uh, every, every time you do it. It's interesting yeah. because an audience that comes in, some audiences, you know, we all have the little things in our room we can hear, and I can generally tell from the buzz, the chitter chatter, before the play whether it's gonna be a good night or a mm -hmm. bad night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes I'm wrong, but mostly yes. the tone yes. of what's out there yeah. can really dictate what happens on stage. M my favorite sound is when you can hear a house full of people listening. Mm -hmm. That's a very specific sound. It is. It's a very specific <clears throat> silence. It's but not you, a dead silence. I've, it's I've silence never experienced that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what do you do, you know, if you're in a play where the, you can't let the audience Hijack the play. I know. So there no been matter times, how much they may want to. Right. Oh, so there are nights, no there are nights though, as happen. a cast, we all know that we may have to muscle it a little harder tonight to, to control the audience. So that changes the performances, but mm. well, there's the whole in, it just is because if the audience is, is impeding in a way that we find uncomfortable, and it's not like we plan it and we talk about it and we strategize it, it's like you said, you hear it, you can feel it. Well, we'll do, we'll do and, a hubble, you know, you know, if we have a little, yeah. if there's a little break mm -hmm. somewhere, <clears throat> I mean, I know that, like, you know, in the play we're doing now, Shalhoub and I will go into a quick huddle. <laughs> we're like, I, I think the air conditioning's off. They're falling asleep. Oh, yes, okay, yes. louder, faster, go. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, exactly. <laughs> and then there's also the cell phone situation. Oh, God. Like, what I, to do. I was really worried about what? that when I came, but uh, what do you do? I don't well, I ignore we, it. That's what I have to do. I, I sort of... We, we all sort of huddled together before our show started running, and, and I was like, what's our policy going to be? Does this time stand still? Time stands still, and we, which is a quiet play. <laughs> it can be. And unfortunately, the reality now is, I can remember a few years ago, a cell phone would go off once a week. And at least every within night. this run, it was every show. Yeah. Every single show, it is, two or three times. It astounds me show. that they it's actually have really? the announcement. Oh yeah, before Please yeah. Turn they off walk down the aisle. Yeah, the they yell at you. We have one mm. woman who runs. <laughs> I'm not even good. Anyway, I'm not going to name names, but when I was you know, years ago, when I was doing View, there was a, a moment in the play, and a cell phone went off quite loudly, and the person took. And this was a very well-known person, took the call. Um, and then oh, got yeah. up. She was in the yeah. middle aisle. She got up and she kind of went, excuse me, yeah. excuse me. Did she point to you like this? Like, no, 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 no. She, 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 I heard like, she, then, okay. walked, she yeah. then walked down the aisle going, I'm, I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm at the theater watching a play. Mm. Yeah. And then walked out into yeah. the lobby. Mm. Well, she, and it was, yeah. Have you guys ever stopped better. a performance well, what, and, and yelled at people? Well, what, I haven't yelled at people, but what we decided to do was to figure out whenever the cell phone would go off, is it something you can play through? Or mm -hmm. do you just hold? And what we would do is we would just <sighs> hold if it was possible because there's not just the phone ringing, there's the disgust of everybody around them, there's the finding of the cell phone in the bag, there's the talking of everybody. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you have to sort of gauge whether or not it's mm -hmm. something you can breeze through or if you have to recollect the audience. Yeah. How aware are you of what's going on in the house when you're performing. Completely. Completely. Really? We know yeah. everything. We know every playbill that's being pushed. We know every bag that's under the seat. We yeah. know what woman's back isn't comfortable. We, you hear. You hear everything. You hear really? Every, I don't even know what's everything. going on on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I think it depends I, I on the play. If it's a very it quiet it's play, true. you know what's going it on. Yeah. It depends. It depends on If it's a very boisterous play. I was play, worried you know. about that, but I, there's nothing that's happened in the audience that has taken me out. So oh, far I know, out, I, 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 I don't think yeah. it's necessarily. You know what I mean? no. So you haven't had the congenital <laughs> yarn yet. Uh, we had go? all of it. We had know. one guy, this old guy, who sat in the front row, and he took his program and put it on his head like a hat. Now clearly, there was a marital problem. <laughs> that his wife, you know, he didn't say anything. He didn't snore. He, but he was in the front row with the program on like a teepee, and you're just like, really, dude? <laughs> You know, of yeah. course you notice it because it's like, come on, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, you talked, we talked about how performances grow and change and, and over time. What's the experience, at a certain point your director leaves and then may come back after a certain point? Mm, wow. What is the experience of when the director comes back and may tell you things, you may think you've grown and your director may think you've strayed? What are those conversations like? They're only visiting for a day. 
So it's kind of like having lunch with an ex who doesn't like your shoes. I mean, it can be like that, but I've, but I've had directors that have come back that were like livid. Mine. They're absolutely, they're Thank great. You. But livid. I mean, livid. You could see that, but these, this particular director was very meticulous and wanted his actors to be almost like robots to do exactly the play as we rehearsed it, as he left. Anything added, inflection, body movement, whatever, he got really ticked off, and it was amazing truly amazing that he was speechless and livid. We got notes and then he went away and then we settled in. Some of his, you know, some of them were really, mm -hmm. I mean, I agreed with a lot of them, but I've had that also, um, the director never comes back. You know, I think, I think the issue is that, that it, it's, a, it's a perfect example of, of the, the truly collaborative mm -hmm. nature of, of theater, that, that, that when, when the director comes back, he or she may notice changes which may or may not be uh, to their liking or may or may not be to the benefit of the, the production. But the truth is that you can't help but change. It, yeah. it's, right. it's an organic it's thing. That's a it's part going of to the grow. process. It's, and and it may grow. not, you know, the, the, the shoots that come off the main trunk may not be quite as perfect as you would hope. But the thing is, it, it's an inevitable process. And, and I think the director, the director's job, I think, in that in that scenario, is to sort of accept that fact and then yeah. and and just you know do some pruning, surely. Yes. But, but but you can't you can't expect a play two months, three months, whatever down the line to be exactly the same as it was. No, because you discover night. stuff as you're going along. It's going yeah. to change. I think it everything. depends on the director too. Also, we're we're so lucky because yeah. you know, we have Stan Tucci <laughs> directing us at the moment and. I'll never work with him. Uh, and I <laughs> recommend, I recommend him not. Um, that's what he says about me now. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, he's the kind of person that will come back and he understands that it grows. He understands yeah. that there's, a, in my case, there was exponential growth, so he's actually thrilled. Um, so, not so hot in the beginning. Um, and But he has a, he has a great way of letting you incorporate the new stuff that you have w without letting the play run away. Uh, right, and that's good. Yeah, that's good. But he's and, also an actor, and I think yes, actors I think that make good directors a great and deal. just because they know what your growth period is and what happens and what you don't see and what you do see. And they but can don't you think, it. I, you know, as a younger actor, all those weeks of arguing about everything in rehearsal because I have to do this this oh, way yeah. or that I way. Mean, yeah, yeah, when you're older you realize the director is going to leave. So, and then the play is going to settle. So I don't really fret about a lot of that stuff as a younger actor. I mean, unless of course it, we're talking about the direction of the whole play or the character, if it's, if it's a major rift. But a lot of things that I used to fret about and try and work and butt heads about, I know he's going to go away or she's going to go away, it's going to settle, and those things will take care of themselves, you know. Well, it's interesting. <coughs> you mentioned Stanley Tucci, who is directing his first, certainly his first Broadway play. I'm not sure if it was his first play ever, but a well-known actor. Um, there are actors who become directors. Um, there are directors who've never acted. I'm always intrigued by Doug Hughes, who is the child of two actors, but he is a director, um, which I always consider the ultimate parental revenge. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering, do you find differences between those who have been actors and those who have always traveled the directing route in terms of how they work with you? Well, Doug was a, an actor, I think, before, a director, and, I mean, he, he gave such a, uh, I wish everybody in the world could have seen the speech that he gave before we started rehearsals for Royal Family, which is a love letter to the theater and to actors. And I admit, I was, I was uh, you know, I was a little bit tired of it all, tired of the business part of it, and I walked into his um, rehearsal room and he gave this speech and he incorporated his parents, he incorporated his acting experience, he incorporated, you know, things from the 16th century, you know, passing the flame, and and I cried for three hours after that. I, I was I was so moved by what he said. I was so taken to the roots of why we do this that um, I wish that he could have told that to everybody. I mean, I think um, I, it was just such a wonderful speech about talking about how beyond that stage door, inside that door, you know. Nothing little happens. Big things happen through that. And when his parents would get up from the table to go every night 
you know, and I have a child, and you know, it's, you get up from the table to go to the theater every night, and he's, he would talk about how he wanted so badly to go with them because the, the, there was such beauty and bigness, and, and so there's nothing more dead than a dead actor. I mean, it was just all these things. It was just these beautiful, beautiful things that he would say. And I, I, I said to my husband, I said, well, I retired and I'm back. <laughs> he goes, and no one knew. I said, yeah, well. <laughs> Did you record that speech? So you could play I, I it every wish, morning. I wish I would have like, filmed it. It was just, yeah. it was beautiful. Well, that sounds like a director who loves actors. I've, you know, worked well, with does, directors. Yeah, he definitely does. Who yeah. I've gotten the distinct feeling that they don't like actors. I mean, a, a quite a few of them. I mean, where it's mm -hmm. like, it, it, the sense that, you know, the theater is great, except for one problem, the actors. The actors. <laughs> Only you I know, can and do this in claymation. Right, and, and so you have good. to work around with and amongst people like that, too. So yeah, Which is which is so it. peculiar, I find, because it, it, it's, it's... It is, it's, but it's a reality. Well, exactly, because yeah. it's, a, it's a problem that if you're making a movie... I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure we've all worked with lots of movie directors who really, really could could work with, could care less about actors. And, that, and, that, and in a way, when you're making a film, it's, in a way, it's, it's different because y you, you can somehow survive without yeah. the director somehow. You can, and I they mean, just want to get in the editing room anyway. Yeah, but, so. but, but, but in the theatre, which is essentially the <coughs> actor's medium, you know, uh, TV belongs to the writers, movies belong to the director, but a theatre belongs to us. And, and, and I think there's always that... It's interesting because it ties in with this whole thing about when, when the director leaves. Because I think, I mean, I mean I, maybe I should just speak for myself, but there's always, there's, I always find the day the director says, I won't be in tonight, there's a little tiny naughty <laughs> boy inside <laughs> me kind of going, Yes! <laughs> Get that. There is, of course. But, you know, but, but, but theatre directors who find, who find actors an inconvenience. Yeah, it, uh, they're in the they're in the wrong business. Mm -hmm. They're in the wrong business. I think so, but I've worked with them. Yeah, I, I, I there's a very no, very well known actor. <laughs> We're doing a production, and a friend of mine he goes, I'm, yeah, "I'm watching you for weeks. I don't really know exactly what you're doing with the character." And he goes, "I don't want him to know. As soon as he leaves, I'll bring the real stuff out." So it was like it was like warfare. It was like guerrilla warfare. It was hilarious. But because he said he said if, if I show him what I'm going to do, then he's going to change it and it's going to ruin it. So he was doing like a whole different character. Actors are crazy. When you too. find yourself in that, when you find yourself in that situation where it yeah. becomes, and it can become a bit combative, about choices. And I, I've been in situations not where there was disagreement about the whole play, but there were certain segments in the play where my interpretation I felt was correct and the director's in director felt their interpretation was correct and so there's a bit of head butting and I was told by one director was you could do it my way or you can read the review in the New York Times <laughs> and uh, but I did it my way and it worked out fine but it, it, that actually doesn't help if you're working with a director who's really kind of hell bent on getting their way if you get, uh, if you're, if that particular moment or piece or whatever it is in the play works out, it actually becomes more of a war. It becomes yeah. now this war of um, uh, wills more than anything. It becomes about people's egos. And what you said was really interesting to me because when I was young, <laughs> I would fight everything. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I wasted yeah, yeah. so much energy. Yeah. And now I go like this. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, great, fantastic. And then I'll probably do it my way mm -hmm. again, and they'll go, that's exactly what I was it's, talking about. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's it, that's right there. there. You're, why couldn't you do that the first time? Yeah. Well, and in the, the best of situations, it's a joint discovery. Mm -hmm. And, yes, that's, you know, in the best of situations, when you have directors who are, you know, the real men of the theater, I sort of think of them as, you know, they're, they want to hear what you can bring to the table, stuff and insights that they don't know, and you want them to to guide and shape and, you know, get the train going. I have to say, yeah, mostly, that's... those are the kinds of <laughs> yeah. people I've worked on. I, mean, I, like, I can't think of an, an awful experience but on, I did, on like, stage. On, but on the race, David one. would come in. David oh, the, the would play, come in. Yeah, the, the play, yeah, the play, you know, sucked wind, but, it, you know, but the experience of working with the director, Oh, I, I've had those moments, like, within the first week, I'm like, oh, I'm going down on the ship. Well, it Here happens. Here we go. It happens. It oh, does. Yeah. I was going, you know. okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right, should sense I of jump humor. Or should I let's stay go. Here? I didn't no. know. Yeah, but you're let's, talking about collaboration. Go. I didn't know how collaborative David Mamet would be. Why would he want because to Because he's to both us? the director and, and the writer. The writer but but it was really wonderful. And I kind of like that trip where we're all going down it together. I mean, he would come in, you know, and say, "Look, I've been up all night. I'm fretting over this 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 part of the play, and we're going to change everything." And so we'd all go, "All right." You're going to do this, you're going to do this. I'm going to take your line, I'm going to give it to him. He's going to stand over here. David, you're going to sit here, now do it. And we go, okay. So we did it, and then at the end he goes, what do you think? And we go, please put it back the way it was. And he goes, okay, never mind. No, so, no, no, no. so, I mean, that's what it was. It, it's collaborative, yeah. and I kind of like that. Not a director that says, I know everything. It's going to be this way, as opposed to... I wanted you to try something. It didn't work. I was yeah. wrong. Let's try something. And you rather judge them on how they talk to other actors, too. Mm. You see how they interact with other actors, and mm. you see the choices that they're both making, and you kind of can figure out, yeah. hmm, that well, the was really, a mistake, the really, or that The really was good ones understand that every actor is an individual. Mm -hmm. Some actors need, you know, every, every actor needs a different kind of treatment, in a way, to get the best performance out of them. Some actors need to be kind of ignored. Uh, and left alone. Some actors need to be yelled at. Some actors need coddling. Some actors need. It just depends. Yeah. That's I, interesting. I can and so, so you become yeah. the director. <coughs> a good director to me is, you know, part psychologist, part social worker as well. Yeah. well and then there's, there are the wonderfully generous directors who will sit and they'll watch you. And I can remember watching Richard Eyre do this, and I've seen Dan Sullivan do this as well. Uh, he'll be watching an actor or they'll be watching an actor. And he, they'll notice something that they don't like. I can see it, I can see them clock it, I can see them realize that's not the right choice, that's not the greatest way to go. And they won't say anything, because they know the next time through the actor will get there on their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is such a gift. I mean, that, but you know. You know <laughs> Anthony Page would just make you do it over and over and over again, and when you just thought you were so there, so truthful, so in the moment, he'd go, let's do it one more time. And, and it was such a, a lesson because, of course, mm -hmm. that's, that's not your ultimate goal, yeah. is that one time. You have to do it over and over again, so mm -hmm. just you clocking know, those things. You were talking about how directors talk to other actors. I remember working with Michael Bennett. And you know, being in this long dressing room, there are like four actors, and he went down the line giving us notes, and it was like watching a schizophrenic. I mean, because yeah. every actor required a different thing. He yelled at the first guy, yeah. you know, <laughs> hugged and kissed the second guy. But that's what. It, but each person he knew, he was brilliant at knowing what you need, what your psyche needs to get what he wants. Yeah. It's such the biggest a biggest empathizer. So, yeah, a and it was just, yeah, it well. everybody was different. Can I bring another relationship into this? Because we're really talking actor and director, but as you mentioned, David Mamet is also the writer. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship of the actor to the writer, obviously when you're working with a living playwright who's available to you in the room? Some people say the writer talks to the director, the director talks to the actors. You're the child of a writer. I'm wondering about your perspective and how you how you interact if with the, authors. If the writer's still alive and it's and it's a, a, a first production, I personally I love having the writer there. I love yeah. it. But that's different. I mean, if it's a you need the writer there, especially no one's ever done the play. Yeah, but a lot, still a lot have of actors don't. Out. Lot, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm always surprised at the amount of times when when actors suddenly go, oh, well, I wish the writer wouldn't keep talking. But well, he birthed yeah. the play, so well, you yeah, know, you the, 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 depends on what they're saying too. You know? I know, yeah. but I, I, mean, I, had a yeah, that's true. I had a situation, <laughs> had a situation where there was two very strong. I should qualify my remarks. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> there was a situation where I had two very strong. It was uh, I did a, a play at the Public Court on the open road, and Bob Falls who was the director, and Steve Tessich, who's no longer with us, was the writer. And what was happening was that. Bob would come up and give, I was doing it with Byron Jennings, and, and Bob would come up and give us this direction, and, and, and we'd be like, uh huh, okay. And then he'd walk away, and then when he was just out of sight, Steve Tessage would come running over and go, I want you to do the complete opposite of what he just said. Yeah. And, and this went on for uh, a day or two, and then finally, Byron and I went, You two, come here. Right. Hmm. One of you, you, you guys talk to each other and decide what direction you want, but you can't both give us different direction. Yeah. And I mean, I look back on it now, and it's, you know, it, it was funny at the, it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time, but hmm. you can't have that happen. But having like Tessich there was invaluable. He really had an insight into yeah. this yeah. piece. The power, the power in the room. 
is between the writer and the director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The actors are merely victims of whatever you know collateral damage comes out of that relationship. You know, really, and that and that's a perfect example of that. Yeah. I mean, if if the writer and the director have had enough time to discuss, to work together, to collaborate, to get a kind of unified vision of what they want to achieve in the room, then then it's then it's I, I, nine times out of ten I would argue it's it's plain sailing. But it's when it's when that relationship hasn't quite been mm. absolutely worked out, and that's when the, the actors get stuck in this weird. Th they, they, we become we become the the innocent children in divorcing parents. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort true. of, uh, and, and you're kind of like torn because your loyalties. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, I've I've been fortunate enough to, to have done a few plays with you know new plays with the writer present, and I've always found it to be very very exciting to have the writer there, but often. A language or a grammar has to be worked out so that true communication can occur. And also, so that the, the, the helpful communication. Yes. And, and also, yeah. you don't want to alienate the director because directors can feel a bit threatened. I, I, I see them sometimes if you're talking to the writer and you look at the corner you're, and you see the director <laughs> feeling like they've been excluded <laughs> from something, you know, and, and vice versa. Especially you know, if you're doing yeah. a lot of this. Yes, right. doing <laughs> it, and, again, and a lot of this. Mm. But um, let me ask, when you've got the writer in the room, is there a temptation to ask to know more about your character than what's on the page? Yes, oh, yeah. for me, yes. And, and do the writers know that, and what do, they, what do they share with you? I think they share what they can, certainly. I mean, I don't... I don't I, I, I don't think any writer would willfully be sort of uh, would be obscure about you know. Yeah. About and also, if it's really well written, all that information's in the script. Well, you just I was have to find it. That. It's, it's you know, there are the hints. Play I'm doing throughout. now. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I wanted to not. I wanted to use only the information that was in the script. Other than we're playing lawyers, would a lawyer do this or that, and legal procedural questions. But in terms of the emotional life, because to strip away all of that and say. I wasn't in the room when this conversation was held, therefore it should not impact, you know, unless I find out later. Trying to adhere to the script. So that was freeing. To me it was freeing. So I, I wasn't caught in the minutia of all this, you know. I, I rehearsed a play with, with, with Edward Bond, <coughs> with, um, uh -huh. Edward, Edward Bond, who wonderful writer. He is. He was in the room and, and we were rehearsing a scene and suddenly Edward Bond said to the actor, what does that line mean? And the actor in question suddenly froze. It was, it was a bit like being called up into the principal's office. Yeah. And the actor went, um, well, I, I, um, well, I, and, he, and he was completely tongue-tied. He, he, he suddenly felt under such pressure. And then Edward said, no, no, it's a genuine question because I, I really have no idea <laughs> what I'm <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, mean, I, was, I was really lucky with, with View from the Bridge that you know, Arthur was still alive. And he wow. was at every rehearsal. Yeah, Arthur was amazing in rehearsal. Oh he, was, my, he came to the crucible. I, I, as well. would, I would be yeah. doing something. I'd go, um, you know, when you wrote this uh, bit, what did you mean exactly? Uh, why am I cool. not gonna? That's kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. And he cool. was so this because well, you know he'd seen that play done in every language in every country, yeah. you know, over the last 50, 60 years. He was the best resource, you know. Mostly, I was asking him what not to do, hmm. you know. And what was his relationship with the director? Fantastic. So yeah, everybody, right. everybody, kind of, we, we were, we just felt very blessed to have him there. Well, it depends and he was, on the and writer, he's also, doesn't it? He was also such a kind of. He definitely was like a regular Joe, you know. He was. Uh, he's a theater guy. He was so you know? great, you know. He was. The theater guy. We talked about like with David Mamet about <clears throat> productions. There are always these productions of his plays around, and I was like, "Well, what do you do?" Because he was so attentive. This was a new play we were doing. He was directing it, and he said, "Well, my work is done." And, you know, he really. Ha I, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, from our conversations, it was kind of like I've written the play. You're the new director. This is your new cast. Go and do it. You know. Now, unless there was a real big problem. He didn't really make it a policy to kind of hover around, you know. Well, in the case of Arthur Miller, who you're discussing, um, it's almost as if, I mean, you're doing a classic, but the author is still there. I mean, we've been talking about new plays. That's an unusual circumstance I when you have that, an though. acknowledged classic, but can still go talk to the author. There are other times you do classics, certainly Shakespeare or, you know, Moliere, or Ibsen, where you don't have an author to talk to. And is that a different experience when it is just you, script, and your, your company and your director? 
Oh yeah. yeah. But then, but then, then if you're doing, but if you're doing one of those big <coughs> classic plays like a Shakespeare or a Shaw or something like that, you've also got something else which is quite, can be useful, which is a collective memory mm -hmm. of all the other productions uh, that you may have seen or experienced of that of that play, and 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 all of that. It's, it's like a big, big mush of compost. It's all useful stuff that, that you can use. And, you know, I remember doing, the first time I did a Shakespeare play, it happened to be a play that I'd seen two years before. And I was full of the performance of this other actor in that role. And, and I was, and I, I, I stole shamelessly because there was so much of it that really worked. Oh, and I thought, listen, you know, I steal I'm, all the time. I'm, I'm it's gonna, like, you know, are you kidding? You so, know and, what I, and, so I love stealing. You but but then, but then you trust that you trust that the other people involved in the production are, are as are have, hopefully have, more haven't more, seen the one that you're <laughs> haven't seen the one that you've stolen, <laughs> from, but also are smarter than you about that particular play. But well, you know. Shakespeare, the, the whole the, 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 the language, you know, as a really young actor in college, it was like, how do I make this language comfortable and and real and spontaneous? The uh, the way Shakespeare wrote, and I would go to the library at University of Michigan and and listen to all the versions of, because they had recorded everybody. Mm -hmm. And these are recorded, ver you know, the Royal Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And so it was really useful just to hear how people handled the language as a really young actor. And then, Isn't like it you scary said, though, how acting it is, styles change? Yeah. So it is, I mean, amazing? the farther back you get, ooh, scary. it's really scary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a warble, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's the wobbly voice. Right, but you, like you said, compost. It's a bunch of That's information changed. and yes. you kind of oh, send it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I would stay with the wobbly voice. The warbly, I was, I was, I was doing well ah, with the warbly nice. thing. No, but it's, it's that, that, that's something, because I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I availed myself to those recordings when I was, yeah. when I was a yeah. student as well, and, and I lost myself, and they were, they were fantastic. They were really yeah. fun. It's yeah. fun, to, but, you were saying, fun to do the research. But the yeah, sense of uh, the changes, I mean, I, I would be curious to know how, I think acting styles change maybe every other decade or something, but I'd be curious to know, you know that, that anyone whose career is maybe 30 years or more, how, if you saw your work, especially on stage, which we can't do, but if you saw your oh, work God. from 30 years ago on stage, just how different one would be. And I imagine that the change is, is really quite staggering. I think it coincides yeah. with you know, the changes in our, just in our lives in our current society. I mean, mm. you know, I'm sure we don't, you're the same. When I was a kid, there were no cell phones. I never had a computer. What the hell was that? And with all that, that's just an example of kind of like this exponential growth of technology and information. And we have so much more information around us on a daily basis, for better or for worse, but we have it that inform, informs us more as humans. And I think that that comes into performances. Mm -hmm. The more informed you are as a, as a, as a, as a human being, it can't, it can't not permeate who you are and then that in turn comes out in your performances. Yet theater, fundamentally, you mentioned technology. Theater has not changed. It is about being in the moment. Just a little you bit. can't go back and look at it yourself, typically, unless it's been recorded for an archive. Would you want to see what you had done years earlier? You. Nope. I'd be curious. <laughs> I must admit, I'd, 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 I'd be, I, I don't think I'd want to sort of try and emulate it in any way, but I, I'd, I'd be curious to know. It's because it's a, such a live form. I, I don't like when things are recorded, to tell you the truth, because I think that the definition of theater is it's happening now. It's not happened before. It and didn't it have any happen tomorrow. retouches, it's just and it right didn't there. have this. It's, it's just, different. it's okay. right now, and no matter what happens, like if a cell phone goes off, I actually quite love going, geez, was there a piece of information we needed to really mm -hmm, get out there? Mm -hmm. Should we go back? And and everybody being with you and going, we got to go, you know, just by eye mm -hmm. contact, we got to go back because that's the crux of the second act, you know. But that, like that's that. an agreement you make with the audience. I mean, it, you know, I remember going to a play years ago at the public. It was called Prayer for My Daughter. And at this key moment, you know, police, this drug addict grabs the policeman's gun, he holds him at bay, and this gun exploded. I mean, it like the bullets came out, the, the, the oh, barrel just fell, fell apart. just fell apart. <laughs> and, but as an audience member, at least for me, we held perfectly still in silence as the actors went 
gathered this thing together, put it back together, went back, and pushed on. Because it was theater, because they had held us that long, and it, it, it was exciting to see how they were going to figure out and then continue the storytelling, but it's only in theater that that could help. And the that audience, could work, rather. And the audience usually feels like they're in on something yes, when that yes. happens. That happens. As act, I'm sure the actors were mortified. But, well, you know, I mean, but we there, were, there like, were times, you know, when we go, when we go up or, it, mm -hmm. or, or you do something on stage that cracks the other actor up <laughs> or you crack them up, and yeah. it, if you break, what I found is audiences actually really enjoy it because mm -hmm. they feel like for a minute they're kind of like in inside in in the play somewhat. I think they do, but it's I not think a great they thing. Don't. But I think they do, but I think they don't. I think they want to be in this world of of. I think they they want to watch it. I, I think that you know, as somebody was saying that um, there was the producers was going on in L.A. and. And there was this moment that the, the audience, that the, the two actors broke, and they put it in the show. And Jerry Stiller, who is, you know, one of our great comedians, <laughs> he came to the show and um, he said, "I loved it. Don't do the laughing thing. You're better than that." Wow. And I, I really agree with that. I just think it's. If you build it in, that seems. Cheesy. Yeah, I know that's that cheesy. Seems but, cheesy, but if it happens spontaneously. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. you know, if it happens at the same point, though, you know, I just think that the audience, I just think that they, they've paid a lot of money to be in this experience where. There is, you know, that there's this different reality going on up there. But, but I'm no. talking about our unforeseen yes, circumstances. Yes. That it's yeah. theater, Which makes as it in exciting. life, it's never going to be perfect. And yeah. things happen on the stage that you have to soldier through and find a way out uh, and just keep going. And you, you all know? have to be malleable. And that's what's yeah. great about it is you're all in that experience together. Yeah. If something goes desperately wrong, it's exciting to see this action on the stage of how are we going to get through this together. I got stuck out on stage because I forgot where I was. <laughs> and then I just went in the closet because that was the only thing I could do. <laughs> then when I went in the closet, to? I remembered where I was supposed to be and I came out and I'm like, <laughs> you know, that's the performance. But what everybody do you guys thought it was part of the programs? play. What do you do about programs? Because we came, we started our run, it was like, you know, somebody put their program on the stage. Oh, and I, then I, James I, goes, I, I right, James goes, he yeah. kicked it off. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Because if that were me, I'd be stressed for the whole performance. So that was on his side of the stage. And like a few weeks later, there's someone puts a, pro, a program on my side. I'm like, well, I got to kick it off. <laughs> James kicked his off. So I'm on this side. I got to hold this down. I got to kick it off. So I'm doing this line. I go and I went, I did this. Oh my God! Volley. I mean, I did the soccer you kick. You punted it like, so hard <laughs> for the rest the of the performance. Every time I walked near there, the guy was like, "Well, you know, you put oh, it on the that's stage. my that's that's my that's that's the one that's the one. You know, I, I try to think of myself as a rational, yes. caring human being, but the one thing that really just to, it pushes my buttons is when people do things like put their playbills on oh, the yeah. stage, prop their feet up against mm. the stage. Because I think, you know, and I, 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 have, I make no apology for sounding kind of sort of pompous about this, but I think that's a sacred space. Yes. Well, that's, that's pompous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I try, yeah. I want to ask a quick question for quick answers before we wrap. I know that we have a Juilliard alumnus, a Yale School of Drama alumnus. If you now could give Madame Zena's Acting Academy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the no, no School of Acting Academy. Oh. No school. <laughs> if you could give your younger self when you were starting out one piece of advice that you've learned, is there a single thing you wish you had known then that you know now? Don't make up your mind too soon. Learn to think twice. Mine would be uh, respect everyone revere no one uh in the auditioning process never walk into a room with your cap in your hand how do you mean can you explain that yeah don't go in like they're doing you a favor you, it's a, it's an equal exchange you're giving them your talent they give you money that's the equal exchange in in being hired as an actor so many actors go into auditions kind of Right. with this kind of begging quality and I, I think that you have to respect yourself as an actor and you never you just don't walk in with your hat in your hand uh, if you get the part you do and if you don't don't never mind there's another one there's no last 
part. I mean, when I was a much younger actor, I was like, I have to get this role because they'll never do a film like this. There'll never be a part like this. There'll never be a production like this. If I don't get this role, then my life will never be the same. There's always another role, another part. So mm -hmm. you kind of, it's like what you said. You get it, you don't get it. Yeah. Also, do not dress in character because if you, things go badly, that's a long <laughs> drive home. So, Trust me, I've seen where yeah, people, yeah, people no, dressed as cat woman in. walking across the lawn. No, over, just give them a hint, but don't dress in Victorian yeah. head to toe. <laughs> that's, that's all. Uh, I think it's to not be afraid of the fact that no one is one thing. That a lot of times people will you have to be careful about what people say to you because you can take it too intensely. And people will say, oh, you're, you're this type, you're that type, you're this kind of actress, you're that kind of actress. And that can really stunt somebody. I think you can let people say whatever they want to say, but just realize that you, there's so much more to every human being. You know, actors don't do just one thing. We do a lot of things. But aren't you, aren't you and, I'm constantly amazed yeah. how complete strangers on the, come up and tell me what I should be doing. Oh, absolutely. I yes. just fucking I'm just intelligent but wounded. It floors That's me. All I, am. You know, I got I career can... advice from a, a sky yeah. cap, and I'm like, could you put my bag in the car? Could you? What? <laughs> really? Yeah. Or you could know. you become my agent? Because <laughs> That's, That's right. not a bad yeah. idea. I, I, yeah. but I, think well. it's just, I think it's just to keep learning, just stay with it. Just yeah. you know, keep mm. learning. I don't know. Well, thank you all so much. This has flown by, and thank you for your time today. And thank you so much for the extraordinary performances you've been giving us all for so many years. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Howard Sherman, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. Our annual theater company grants support New York not-for-profits and since they began have distributed nearly $3 million. We are also pleased to be the home of the Jonathan Larson grants, which support emerging composers and lyricists. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.